have individual ideas of our own. So, um, uh, you know, as long as there's people on stage who are smart, I personally uh, think it's okay to be men or women. Uh, but anyway, sidebar. Um, mm. Thank you so much for coming along to our session on uh, stereotypes in branding. My name is indeed Kerry Finch. I am the founding partner at Future Factor. And what we do with our clients globally is we help them cut through the noise to make purposeful impact. And we do that through um, communication strategy, through content, and through public relations. I'm delighted to have um, uh, our panelists on stage today. Um, Sally Smallman is the global strategy director for the whiskies at Diageo, so uh, specifically Johnny Walker. Amanda Fev is partner and chief strategy officer for creative agency Anomaly here in Amsterdam. And Eileen Boschman is head of content for digital agency Dept. Um, thank you so much for coming along, everybody. Uh, what I want to start with is that recent research from this year has shown that 70% of men and women find that the stereotyping in adverts, specifically advertising, is completely out of touch. Um, Sally, can I come to you first and ask, why are brands still relying on, or many brands, not every brand, but many brands are still relying on stereotypes? Is this through laziness? Is this through uh, smart business sense? Or is it absolutely an unconscious decision? Yeah, so small question, right? Yes, tiny, <laughs> tiny. Let's, let's start, start small. With, let's start with that. <laughs> um, I think, I mean, there's two things that come to my mind to maybe kick off this discussion. I think. The first one is that actually stereotypes are incredibly helpful um, in some ways. They're shortcuts um, to a level of understanding and a depth of understanding sometimes that we wouldn't otherwise be able to explain easily through marketing comms. So I think I wouldn't want to say it's laziness that drives brands towards stereotypes, but I think there's an understanding of the extent to which you can communicate when you successfully leverage a stereotype. Um, I think the other thing, though, is that everybody here has a level of unconscious bias about the decisions that they're making. And so a lot of the times when we are presented with creative work and creative ideas, the way we as clients respond to those is loaded with unconscious bias of all types. And I think that's probably why stereotypes continue to be used in marketing in many different ways, simply because you're not aware of the level of bias that you might have. Amanda, as a creative agency um, partner, how, how do agencies, or your specific agency, how do you relate to that? What, how, how do you work with perhaps clients who are asking for something where you just think, whoa, whoa, this needs to be really researched and checked out? I mean, sometimes it doesn't even need to be researched and checked out. I think your interpretation on the role that stereotypes can play in marketing is maybe potentially a generous one. I think the reality of all of our worlds is that it's very, very complicated. And I think one thing that stereotypes can sometimes successfully and effectively do is make the world a little bit easier to navigate, but it can also be very, very reductive. So I think as a kind of creative agency, we have to be mindful of our outputs and specifically that we're not perpetuating gender stereotypes in the work that we make. We need to be mindful of who makes those outputs. We need to make sure that we're getting equal representation behind the camera, not just in front of it. But it goes all the way upstream. We also need to make sure that we have a diverse group of people working in the agency who represent lots of different positions and lots of different lived experiences so that we get to work which isn't biased uh, one way or the other. Eileen, you uh, recently, well, we spoke about, you know, um, advertising and brands and examples of what we find to be uh, right or wrong or controversial. Yeah. You, you, we talked about um, the New York pizza advertising. Yeah. Uh, I just want to know who saw the New York pizza advertisement with the cauliflowers? Oh, yeah. Breastage. <laughs> yeah, if you missed it. That. Well, so New York Pizza had this advertisement um, saying they had cauliflower-based pizzas, and they decided to display that via a woman holding two cauliflowers in front of her breasts, which is very suggestive. Um, was she topless? Yeah, she was naked except for the cauliflowers. You didn't see her face, but yeah, very suggestive. 
Um, and when it comes to that, it obviously received a lot of backslash because it, it is quite sexist. And um, people started writing about it, commenting about it, social media blew up. And obviously, the agency behind it, who also who made the campaign, got a lot of backslash as well. So it wasn't just New York Pizza. It was also the agency behind it that, um, that got the backslash as well. So they got a negative, uh, negative name in that. And you, you have a very specific view about whether you think it's a successful um, uh, brand um, positioning. Yeah. So I didn't agree with the, with the cauliflower commercial, the New York Pizza commercial, as my colleagues all know, because I was quite angry about it. Um, but it doesn't necessarily mean it wasn't a success. So I'm one of those people who... Uh, who goes online and checks out the, the responses to those articles that write about whether it's a, a successful campaign or not. And uh, on Facebook and on Instagram, I actually saw a lot of responses of people saying, well, I think this is quite funny. What, what is the big problem? What, why are people upset about this? Can, can, can we make jokes anymore nowadays? Mm. So it got me thinking, Apparently, there is a big group of people as well that still appreciate that. I don't say it's, it's the right thing to do, and I, I do agree that brands should take a stand and be a little bit more aware of the power they have uh, on people and establishing stereotypes. But um, I don't necessarily believe that it cannot be a success nonetheless, because sex still sells, apparently. Oof. Amanda, is a... <laughs> <laughs> Yes, you're going to go there. Uh, so what, what's your response to an advert like that? What is your response as, uh, as a partner in a, in a creative agency? Would you have taken a similar stance? Uh, I'm curious. Well, uh, well, it certainly never would have gotten out of our doors. I mean, I think that work like that is a reminder of just how pervasive unconscious bias is. I am sure that that creative team never sat down and said, I have a great idea, we're going to do something really sexist today because it's going to get a lot of people's attention. <laughs> right. However, <laughs> what the work does is reinforce the belief that women are objects and men are people, and with that, I am completely unokay. And I think, you know, there's a slogan in the US for when you see something suspicious, it's important to tell the police, which is just, if you see something, say something. And I think no matter how you classify your gender, no matter who you are, no matter what your life has been like, when you see something that fundamentally you know is wrong, you have to say something. With clients, going back to your question from before, you might not always win the, bottle, the battle, but you certainly have to fight. So that could be something as simple as, in a scenario, let's not show the dad at work and the mom at home. Can we flip that, please? And to be honest, sometimes I'm still staggered that we don't win those conversations, but you have to have them. And as a, as a champion for you know, the whiskey brands at Diageo, what is your response to um, pushback from, from, from your agency partners? How does that work with you? I think in, I think in this area in particular, it's been very much a joint journey. So I would be really interested to know what kind of conversations might sometimes happen in the closed doors when, when they, ideas are... When you're are, locked out. When we're locked out. <laughs> no, but when, when, I, you know, when ideas are early um, and when we're still kicking things around, because what there should never be is an inhibitor to creativity or to stop ideas being discussed. It's more, I think, about recognizing some of the challenges with creative ideas and making sure that you're presenting them in as unstereotyped a way as is possible, um, as is possible to do. Yeah. And I, I mean, we, we had a lot of conversation um, about Magnum advertising, actually, which is probably a brand a lot of people in the room have touched or worked on or love, um, and how very objectifying of many female characters that those ads actually are. Um, even to the point of, you know, a woman walking with a tiger. I, I mean, I, I, I forget. Nothing wrong with animal print. <laughs> Nothing wrong with animal print. <laughs> Nothing wrong with animal print. But and when, you, when you explain it like that, it's almost like, I can't believe that was actually, I've actually just said that. And yet it's a relatively recent advert, mm. um, which again, no one probably went out to say, today we're going to objectify women, and yet somehow that went through the process. So it's... It, it's I think it has to be a joint journey that people are going on, and I think it's incredibly hard with a, you know, a, a more conservative perspective and a more progressive perspective 
I think those, those relationships will be very challenged, mm. actually, as this takes root. I, you mentioned something about humour, uh, which I think the Dutch are brilliant at in their, in their you know, positioning of brands. I think humour is relied on a lot. I think it's similar in the UK. Um, but where does, where does being funny and humour uh, start and stop, and then it moves into you know, unconscious bias, or it moves into some kind of exploitation in some way. Yeah. What's your, what's your thinking on that? Um, well, humor is very subjective, so I'm, I'm, it's a very difficult question. Um, it's very personal. But I do think that we should steer away from those typical jokes we hear over and over again all the time, saying uh, the only right, no, the, I, at enige recht is je hebt het Sorry, it's a Dutch joke, but stuff like that, you know. Um, it's ever so funny. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I never laughed about it, but apparently people do. Um, but yeah, so we have those typical jokes, and they reinforce negative stereotypes. Mm. And there's no balance in that. We mm. only hear jokes about minorities or, or, or other groups of people that are very easy targets. And nowadays, you get more of those, oh, yeah, must be a typical white men type of joke. Yeah. And that's mm. quite new, actually, for me. So I see it balances out a little bit more, um, that everybody is basically a target for humor nowadays, and not just the groups that are, uh, yeah, are very prone to, to humor always. So, mm. But it's, there's a lot of gray area, and it's very difficult because yeah, Dutch humor is different from uh, German humor, for example. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's very, yeah, as an international agency, we also cope with that, saying we have German agency, or we have a German part as well. Um, does our branding work the same way in Germany? We have to, yeah, we have to balance out those cultural differences as well. But then I think it's kind of incumbent on us when you are maybe, uh, you know, trying, like I think there's absolutely a role for humor to play in modern communications. I think the question you have to ask yourself is, is this humor coming at somebody's expense or perpetuating yeah. a harmful stereotype? So in the ASA, there was just a ruling. It's the um, uh, Advertising sorry. Standards Association. The Advertising yeah. Standards Authority in the UK, there was a ruling um, where they have legally outlawed basically gender stereotypes in advertising or harmful gender stereotypes in advertising. And there's one advert that shows two dads who are out for lunch who kind of misplace a baby on a sushi restaurant's kind of rotating conveyor belt. And I think that ad was banned, and a lot of people said that it's, you know, political correctness gone too far, it's, it's, it's wrong. But I think what we don't realize is that the sum total of that kind of example that says men are rubbish at childcare, therefore it's a women's responsibility, perpetuate the belief that childcare is women's work, and that in turn limits women's career potential, their earning potential, and has a massive impact on families and also on future generations. And so I think sometimes you have to have extreme correctives to try and balance out what has been a highly, highly biased situation. Mm. Um, some stereotypes yeah. You know, clearly some stereotypes can be negative. When is it, when is it working well that stereotypes actually, you know, are, are positive? How do, where, where's that balance lie, do you think? Because I think that's a tricky tightrope as well. Some stereotypes can be overcorrected, mm. for yeah. example. Sally, do yeah. you have a thought on that? I think, well, I think it's interesting when you think about nationality, actually, because often you know, there's a certain, a very strong stereotype associated with a particular country, for example. And actually, if countries are smart, they can leverage that stereotype brilliantly. So um, I don't know if you guys are aware of the um, Air New Zealand have a long-term partnership with the All Blacks, and they use the All Blacks as part of their safety videos and things like that. An incredibly effective communication. And to, to get people to watch something that they know they've seen a hundred times before or may have seen many times before, so I think there's something about, you know, I think used with, a, I was going to say a light touch, but used with a real expert eye mm -hmm. and a knowledge of what you're doing, then I think a stereotype can, can communicate very positive things. Um, but the intent is to be very positive about New Zealand, yeah. you know, and it, I think what's interesting and in what we've been saying is the imbalance in the communications that we've seen. I mean, Amanda was telling me earlier about you know, even in kids' movies, I think 75% of dialogue is delivered by male characters. And if you look at non-human characters, it's even higher than that. So it's a, a tiny fraction of dialogue. So all dogs in, are boys. All dogs are boys. All, dog, all, all dogs, all, 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 dogs all robots, all, yeah. 
And if I think about what, I mean, I've watched a lot of Disney movies over the last 10 years because my son has t turned 10 last week. So what I've fed him that for 10 years, and I am sitting here talking about this now. And it's, but that's, yeah. that's a brilliant that's, example of unconscious bias. Yes. You know, that you're not yes. noticing it, but once yeah. you, once you pick up on it, it some, things, some facts like that come and slap you on the face. Exactly. And then you wonder how you missed it yeah. exactly. all those years. All this time. Yeah. And I mean, I think the most important thing is you have to confront the truth in order to affect a change. You have to recognize yeah. that this is wrong, and that's why it's really important, I think, you know, as creative agencies and clients, that we do regular audits of the work that we're creating, but also of the people that we have working in-house. Because I think if we're going to get to work and solutions and brands that work for everybody, there have to be women in the room. You know, you have to have broad representation in the room. I think part of what makes stereotypes so enduring is that they make it, they're a shortcut. They make it much easier for us to navigate. Yeah. But they're also, by necessity, binary. And I think we all know that the world that we live in isn't binary. There's a spectrum of lots of different things. And so while so they might So, for example, we were talking about gender fluidity earlier. Right. You know, I mean, it's easy for me to kind of stand up here and give my perspective as a person, but I can't speak on behalf of all women. I have to recognize that there are people who have many different experiences who would say, you know, gender is a construct. And I think you have to respect the fact that despite the fact that people in this day and age are still show throwing these massive gender reveal parties for babies, pinkification is not helping us. It's not, it's not, it's not a good thing. Eileen, yeah. yeah. um, what has inspired you to think differently? You know, it might be a piece of work that someone's done, it might be your own team, it might be some kind of uh, experience outside of business. What's, in what's inspired you to think differently about stereotypes? Um, well, when I graduated college, I started my first job and I was very excited about that. Uh, but I realized quickly that I ended up in some sort of toxic situation with uh, a boss that was, well, I, I'm not going to repeat whatever he said, but it was often very sexist, but at the time I didn't quite realize it. Um, and I was a journalist, so I started writing about it just to like get it off my chest or something. I, I, I didn't know what to do with it. And uh, after one and a half years, I quit and I started writing about it. And I started talking to people about it. And then I realized, wow, this is not okay at all. I mean, I wasn't used to getting that type of feedback or whatever he said, but... What did you do about it? Well, I didn't do anything about right. it at the moment um, because I was overwhelmed by it. I was like, very intimidated and I, yeah, I wanted to keep my job. I wanted to gain some experience, so I just accepted it. But then when I quit the job, finally, uh, I started writing about it and I, I decided, well, next time I encounter something like that, I'm not going to put up with it because this is not okay. I shouldn't be yeah. throwing sexist remarks in my face just because I'm a woman and I'm trying to do my job here properly. Um, and that was the moment I started to like dive deep into uh, all the, the literature there is about unconscious gender bias. Mm. And really, pieces started to fall into place because a lot of times I, um, I felt like I was working twice as hard and People actually told me, um, oh, I expected, an, uh, I expected a man to come in when they said they were going to send a journalist, stuff like that. And at that moment, you sort of laugh a little bit, but it changed something in my, in my head because I thought, well, I'm not a man, so I should work extra hard in order to make that happen. <laughs> Sally, <laughs> Reading very heavily. No, it just makes me angry. Yeah. <laughs> Sally, what about you? Um, uh, could you mentioned to us uh, this week about uh, how Diageo itself has been changing yeah. and, you know, certain characters within the organization who have personally inspired you. Yeah. I mean, I, th I think because Diageo is a, a big um, organization it, and a very diverse one around the world as well, it's been a really interesting journey, actually, to see how an alcohol business which, which did, you know, if you look back 15 years, have a male exec, a predominantly male even working culture, and even now would have um, not an equal gender balance in our commercial teams in particular, in many of our teams. So we're not, you know, at the end of the journey by any means, but there's a but dramatic the difference, mm -hmm. yeah, between when I joined the business, which was in um, Australia in the sort of early 
uh, oh God, well, a few years ago. Um, <laughs> um, you're post sun. Yeah, but pre sun. Okay, well then, more than, more than ten years. More than ten years. More than ten years, with a gap. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it, I mean, it's and, and actually, someone who who is, has inspired me. A couple of people actually. Um, our current CEO um, actually talked about his own experience of feeling very. Um, uncomfortable and the exception on our exec team because when he joined the exec team, he was the first non-white male. Um, most of the other people on the exec team at the time were British as well. Um, and so, and he said, you know, I didn't, I wasn't interested in cars. I didn't play golf. I didn't get the jokes. I was totally isolated in that group of people when I first became a member of the exec, and I just thought, well, you know, I would never, I think he's an empathetic person, but I would never have expected him to feel like that in that situation. Yeah. So it just shows that, you know, you, the sense of being marginalized can happen to anyone almost at any time. Um, and I think also our, our chief marketing officer, who is who's female, um, is incredibly inspiring, and the fact that she stood for this very publicly and to help the women who are coming, you know, behind her, is you know, she? She is someone who succeeded in a very male world and has made the decision to now say something very different. Yeah. And it's quite exciting, I think, to see a, an organisation or to feel an organisation being galvanised behind something because those top two leaders have taken the time to actually look critically at the system that they profited from, yeah. ultimately. Yeah. But that's important, right, to have role yeah. models in place, because otherwise you will never see something, you will stick by your stereotypes. And without role models, you see, all of a sudden you see oh, it, it can be different yeah. as well. And that's very important to have, to see, um, for me, to see women exceed in what they do best is, has been really important and really life-changing for me to, to think, OK, well, if they can do it and I can do it. And, that's why I like the, the, the attention for the Women's World Cup uh, football. Mm. So important because then young girls see, well, I've only seen men uh, playing football, and yeah. now I see women doing the same thing, and I can actually do the same thing. Mm. So I think that's very important. To and I, mean, I think on, on the question of inspiration, it's, it's very easy to call out female leaders who've done a good job to promote gender equality. But I think it's also really important that you call out non-women who've done it. So your example of women's football reminds me of a reporter saying to Andy Murray, how does it feel to be the first person, the first tennis player to ever win two medals at two Olympics in a row? And Andy Murray corrected him and he said, first male tennis player, yeah. Venus and Serena have both done it like four times. And so I think yeah. to take the Diageo example one step further, you know, the CEO mandated a gender balance board. The female CMO didn't just talk about gender equality, but she actually sent letters to her agency leadership, we being a roster agency, and said, I would like to know more about the composition of your internal teams at senior leadership in the creative department throughout the business. And I think a lot of people would say that is completely overstepping the mark. I would say we completely, completely embrace it and recommend it because, again, you have to confront the norms that we're starting with if you ever want to stand a chance in changing them. And I think within my own, own organization, I'm very lucky to be surrounded by really incredible female leaders, but we're also investing in people whose actual job function is to promote normalizing gender equality in marketing. They're not attached to specific client business, but that's us embodying the classic kind of uh, idiom of it's a principle isn't a principle until it costs you money. You know, this is something that we are actively investing in because we believe that we have an opportunity, but also an obligation to try and change it for the better. Yeah, yeah. and of course, stereotyping isn't just about gender, it's about age, it's about race, it's about sexual orientation as well. So exactly. And I think the one thing that is slightly uncomfortable about being on a female panel, although I'm really delighted I am. Um, <laughs> we do support Nancy is, uh, in her uh, opinion um, about women on stage, but um, anyway. But yeah, but I, I'm really, I, it does bother me a little bit that, that there's an overcorrection, mm -hmm. because what should never happen is taking opportunity away from anybody, it should be about equalizing opportunity. Mm -hmm. And I think... And that's complicated. Uh, it's really complicated. And because we're in a transition phase, we probably are going to overshoot sometimes. Yeah. And we need to kind of come back to the e equilibrium. Um, and, and, and maybe I feel it more because I'm a mum now of a, of a white boy who's grown up in quite lucky circumstances. You know, like I'm conscious 
of what all of this means, yeah. mm. specifically for him, you know, and it does make it feel very um, real and a little uncomfortable sometimes, even though I really fundamentally believe it's the right, it, it, it has to be the way we go. Um, just to wrap up then, I'd love mm. to hear from everybody on what we can do, how we can take action, how we can take a step realistically uh, in terms of, you know, as an individual, as a brand, as an agency, how can we, how can we help our colleagues and ourselves move forward mm -hmm. so that we're smashing through stereotypes, whatever type of stereotype that happens to be? Um, Eileen, let's hear from you. Um, well, on a personal level, uh, I started talking a lot to my dad, who is from a different generation. And good, at first, good. I'm glad he's from a different generation. Yeah. <laughs> that would just be <laughs> lucky. Yeah. That's that a good. stereotype smashed right there. <laughs> no, but he, um, he really, at first, he didn't quite understand where I was coming from. Uh, basically saying, well, can I, can I, I can make jokes now, can I? Or, but then I started to explain a little bit more where I was coming from, and he understands it more. And now, I, via WhatsApp, I sometimes get like uh, commercials, and he says, "Wow, this is very, uh, this is very sexist. They should do something about this." So that's that's nice that I at least get through to him at one point. And within the team, I, I noticed that by talking about it. Um, we started to realize that we're also in a tech sector, there are a lot of men at work, and sometimes if we organize an event, um, we say to each other, oh, wow, there are a lot of men actually lined up for this, uh, wanting to speak. Aren't there any women who know about this stuff as well? And yes, there are, but they just need a little bit more positive reinforcement to go on stage. Um, I'm, I'm the same. Um, so. Like on a small scale, making waves like this is very, uh, very important, and that's that's something I'm trying to focus uh, on a little bit more. So two two things I take from that is what you mentioned, Amanda, is if you see it, say something. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and also see it, be it. You know, live live the life that can inspire others, your colleagues or your family or your friends. You know, uh, talking and and being an example uh, is what I take from that, mm -hmm. Amanda. I mean, I think another big thing uh, that we kind of often talk about when we're in creative development is understand what are the conventions in a category or, you know, for the brand that you work on and then, and then seek to bust them, look for ways to deviate from the norm. And I think, again, the reason that stereotypes are so pervasive is because they make our lives easier. You go, oh, I know what that means. But I would really encourage people to spend as much time as they can thinking about what they don't know. And to give you a live example, um, the Viva La Volva ad, which has been rightly rewarded very, very well in all of the creative festivals this year, was a piece of film that was written by two men. So I think if you have the appetite and the hunger to look at the world from a different perspective and to kind of step into somebody else's skin and walk around it in a little while, I think it can take you to places that fundamentally are much more interesting, that will actually break through the clutter, uh, and that can hopefully you know, start to broaden people's perspectives for the better instead of continuing to narrow them. Mm. And yeah. finally, Sally. I think, I think I would say, particularly from a brand perspective, like you can see stereotypes at a thousand paces. So if you really want to do good marketing that builds a brand and, and motivates people to want to choose that brand much more than they do today, using stereotypes is not actually the way to do it. Consumers can pick a stereotype so easily. So I would, I would just say, you challenge yourself, I think, and, and be aware that the consumers will pick it fast, maybe faster than you will. Yeah, I think you're right. We all need to be challenged, you know, every, every day, every year. It's about debate, it's about talking, and it's about questioning. Yeah. Um, so curiosity, I think, is a really strong point here, and, and listening and pointing it out. We've run out of time. I can see the screen's gone entirely red. Um, <laughs> so apparently I'm in trouble. Uh, I want to thank everybody for coming. It's a really yeah, full room, you. so I really appreciate that everybody's taken time to listen. And thank you uh, specifically, Eileen, Amanda, and Sally. Thank you so much. <laughs>